I'm Brian Goldfinger of Goldfinger Injury Lawyers. Is your insurance company forcing you to go back to work when your doctors say you can't? If this sounds familiar, look no further than my law firm. Visit goldfingerlaw.com and get us working for you. Hello and welcome to the Raptors Reaction Podcast. I'm your host, William Loom, speaking to you after the Toronto Raptors outlasted the Dallas Mavericks by a score of 123 to 120 at the uh, American Airlines Arena or something like that. I don't know. Um, yeah, we're in Dallas on the road where the, the Mavericks are actually, you know, they're, they've really fallen off a little bit. They got to like 500 and it was looking like they might go to the playoffs, but they have been, um, you know, they're now five games under 500, but coming into the game, they were one of the best ro- home teams in the NBA. They had a, a record of 18 and six at home. And, uh, I think they really showed why, I mean, they gave the Raptors all they could handle and uh, it really came down to some really, really important. Um, it really came down to some really important crunch time execution by the Raptors to actually get it done. So I'll start at the end and sort of work my way back to the beginning. Um, so the Raptors, uh, offensively, they finally got some clutch baskets. And now Dallas, I'll have to say, not a very de- impressive defensive club. They're, they they kind of rely on DeAndre Jordan to erase mistakes, but he just doesn't play defense anymore. It's actually hilarious. He just <laughs> he really doesn't play defense. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, they finally got – first off, I mean, they finally got Kawhi Leonard going in crunch time, and I don't think it's actually – it shouldn't have been that this hard, but clearly the Raptors have had a lot of troubles with it. Um, one thing they've tried a lot is Kyle Lowry setting the ball screen for Kawhi Leonard, hopefully to get a switch. And every single time it doesn't work. Today it finally worked, in part because the Mavericks can't defend, but also because um, Kawhi was actually able to, instead of backpedaling and allowing the trap to come to him and get himself trapped, he was able to actually attack, go around the trap, and then start, you know, actually turning the corner and going into the paint. Now, the thing is, his dribble is not that great to consistently get himself free for those. Um, he's not a guy that's going to slither into the defense. He's more really going to power pass people. But um, today, he was able to elude the defense, go into the paint, force some help, kick it out. Danny Green, uh, there's a closeout. He, he pumps fakes. He gets into the lane and then goes in for a little one-legged uh, teardrop over DeAndre Jordan. Well, not even over. DeAndre was supposed to be there, but he just got there mad late. Um, but yeah, that was a, that was a key play, but also, I mean, I've been saying this on the podcast forever, right? You don't have to complicate this shit with Kawhi. If you need to come down and get a bucket in half court, you don't have to give the ball to Kawhi. You don't have to set a screen, nothing. Just have him set this, just have him set up in the high post, right? I'm talking like free throw line out to the three point line, right in the middle of the floor. You get, you get him to post and seal his man, which is not too hard. I mean, it's not like someone's going to play on top of him. Then he's going to have a wide open layup, right? So he's going to be able to seal his man. You just feed the ball. It's not a very difficult feed either. Um, and then you just let him go to work isolation. You spread the floor. You have four players, um, you know, spreading the floor. You have the two bigs and the two corners. You have Danny and, and, and Kyle on the wings. And then you just have Kawhi going one on one against the guy where if the defense comes, he can you know identify and kick out really easily because again he's facing the defense. It's not too hard for him to identify the uh, right pass in the situation. But more likely than not, he's able to get a shot. And you know the Raptors did that twice. I think in the last minute of the game, they went to Kawhi Leonard um, on back to back possessions, him right in the middle of the floor, and it worked great. It worked beautifully. Um, you know the first time he. <laughs> one one against West Matthews, blew right by him, got fouled, no call. Um, went to the rim, finished it. You know, great play. He just blew right past him. Like it just, it took him like two steps to get right right around him. Uh, and then the next play, he goes. You know, first one he goes left, second one he goes right, um, and he gets fouled by Matthews, who again gets blown by and has to commit. And you know, those are two very important scores. And I feel like, look, in the future. Going forward, stop running this ball screen with Kyle. Stop trying to run. The, don't run any screen action, okay? Just have Kawhi in the middle of the floor, have him post up, give him the ball. Like, that's just the best way for him to attack. Because, again, I mean, we saw this with, when the Raptors used to play against LeBron, for example. Whenever he would post and then turn around and face up, it was over for the Raptors' defense because no one could guard him one-on-one. And the same situation with Kawhi Leonard. And really, the issue is, I think, 
I don't think Kawhi has necessarily the handle to consistently dribble his way around and capitalize on certain situations. So if you can put him into the post and let him attack that way, it's just it kind of removes him the need to actually dribble, right? And that's why I've been advocating it. I think as far back as like November, I remember like after that Pistons game, I was thinking like, you know what, the Raptors keep running this play, and also that Celtics game. Those two games really stood out to me. I'm just like, I don't understand why you're complicating this with Kawhi. Just give him to him in the middle of the floor and let him operate and. Uh, like the run the mellow play seriously run the mellow play for Kawhi Leonard he he can he can really capitalize off that but uh, that was good and then defensively the Raptors ran a zone defense for a couple of possessions now um, obviously the Raptors defense on the night overall was not great the Raptors conceded 120 points um, you know part of that was honestly just the referees completely lost control of the game and called a combined 72 free throw attempts for the two teams like what 72 free throw attempts. Um, and really, the Mavericks could have won this game if they just shot the free throws better. They shot 23 of 34, um, whereas the Raptors shot t- 32 of 38. So, the, you know, the small little margins really do add up, and they, and they you know, they count. It's a three-point game. There's a couple of free throws. That could have changed the entire result. But, um, yeah, the Raptors obviously just weren't defending very well, as you can tell by the fact that they gave up 120 points. Um, you know, the main thing they struggled with was obviously Luka Doncic, who had uh, a, just a super – just a, a superhuman game, really. I mean, I, I thought watching the game was like, damn, the Raptors are making this guy look like LeBron. And and it wasn't like the Raptors are throwing, like, bad defenders at him. Like, it was Danny Green, a Kawhi, a couple of possessions. Ibaka switched on to him and Pascal. And, like, Don't you just give all these guys buckets. And, look, the Raptors' game plan, I think, was mostly to, uh, you know, play up high, play close to him, take away the three-pointer, um, and force him to drive and, and sort of get twos. And he was really crafty. For a guy who is like 19 years old, Doncic has literally all the complete tools. I mean, I don't know what the hell Atlanta was thinking when they traded away Doncic, or even what the Kings were thinking when they picked uh, Bagley over Doncic. Um, I mean, he has such like a complete game where he can like f- you can hit teardrops with either hand. You know, he's really smooth and clever on the on his drives, he knows when to stop and slow down and get people to run past them and then for him to capitalize. He's really good at throwing the lobs and just a dunk, dump off passes to his big men. I mean, Doncic was just torching the Raptors in pick and roll over and over and over again. And it got to a point where the Raptors just had to say, look, we can't stop this guy. Let's go zone. And it kind of caught the Mavericks off guard. Um, they started taking some bad shots. I think the Raptors were three for three in terms of getting stops in the zone. And, um, you know, late in the game, it was actually Kyle Lowry who really um, – was able to uh, get onto Luka Doncic and play him one on one straight up, and uh, you know Kyle was able to force Doncic to sort of, um, I mean, force him away from the basket and oh shoot over Kyle. And Kyle is just really good at defending, really one on one situations where people try to shoot over him. He's gonna get under you. He's gonna be tough and force Doncic to an important miss. And so that's how the Raptors won this game. So you know they finally got some execution with Kawhi Leonard in crunch time and. Um, you know, they got some defensive stops. And so, you know, it was obviously a difficult game. Like, the Raptors came out real hot. Like, three-point shooting carried the Raptors the whole way. I mean, 17-34 to 34 on the night was crazy. Um, they shot really well in the first half, and that, that really buoyed them. But then third quarter, they went ice cold, man. Four of 19. It was ugly. I think they missed their first 10 shots before Kawhi Leonard took a, uh, a loose rebound and took it the other way and, and got in for a layup. Like, um, yeah, that was, you know, it was an ugly third quarter for sure. But, uh there is one thing that I wanted to highlight. And that one thing was the fact that Kyle Lowry is actually able to come up, like there's actually a way to get Kyle Lowry shots again, which is such a relief because finding ways for Kyle to score has been basically impossible. He has been scoring off junk points and some lucky shots and transition and stuff like that, but he has not been able to score consistently. And the Raptors have, it looks at, at least as the Raptors have finally found a way to get Kyle some open shots. And it's not a new innovative way. Like, Kyle's been here, like, seven years, like, six years or whatever. Like, you know, for the most part, the Raptors know how to get Kyle shots. But um, of late, with Kyle coming back from his back injury, he's sort of been shaky. And the way he found his shot tonight, which, look, he had 19 points on 5 of 10 shooting from deep. And the three-point shooting, a lot of those, I think at least three. I'm not sure because I didn't watch the entire game as closely as I would have normally liked to. But at least three uh, of those five threes came off a set where Kyle was able to start at the left side of the floor, um, circle on the baseline, um, come up to the right side, get around two screens, one from uh, one from Pascal and then one from Serge, and then um, moving to his left, 
get a three off. And, like, he, you know, it, it's just, A, it's, it's nice to see him confident in that shot. And, B, it's just nice to see him actually hit that shot. Like, you know, Kyle has, has had a really hard time this year because, you know, he's had to create for other people. And it's sort of difficult because no one's really creating for him. Um and, you know, it's tough for him to get a shot. But, like, in these set situations where he's able to come around some screens, it's really able to help him sort of gain separation. And even a couple of times where, you know, the Mavericks sort of started sniffing it out. And so when Kyle would come around that second screen from Serge and when he would get the ball, you know, uh, Serge's defender would step up on him and, and meet Kyle at the nine on the three-point line. And the Raptors had a good, pretty good counter for that. Serge would then uh, immediately then f- uh, cut inside a little bit, get to the mid-elbow region. You know, there's nobody around him. And then Kyle would slip the pocket pass and then Serge would hit the mid-range shot. And, like, that's not a bad counter, right? But all things considered, it's actually a play where Kyle Lowry can actually command sort of the attention of the defense and score for himself. And um, that's just very important. The Raptors really, really need Kyle um, to score. Like, they just, they need it. There's no way around it. And, uh, you know, it's it's nice to see him bust out of his slump, you know. Um, you know, hopefully it lasts for sure. But you know, it, the Raptors, it's just nice to see Kyle score, man. <laughs> like, what can I say? It's a huge relief. In terms of some other notes before I move on to uh, three stars and the, the Gerald Henderson Award. Um, the bench actually gave the Raptors some pretty good production. Uh, I thought, you know, Norm came off the bench, was pretty solid, uh, got into foul trouble, I mean, he had 5,060 minutes. Again, the referees lost control of this game. Like, it was it was stupid. Um, OG, you know, he had one moment where he was mad in- indecisive. He had <laughs> Dirk Nowitzki, like, waiting in the paint, and he didn't shoot the ball for some reason and then decided to then later in that possession take a step back, which was just really bad decision-making. But OG hit a corner three, he got inside, you know, like, all right, cool. Uh, but Norm was pretty solid going to the basket. Uh, Van Vliet, I thought it was all right. Um, I just think that, like, he just dribbles the air of the ball. Like, it's just been so much. I, I think part of it is the offense, too. He has to play so much on the ball that he's not, again, he, it's like Kyle, right? He has to play so much on the ball that he's not able to get his own offense that easily because no one's helping him. But he was solid, too, with 13 points, 6 assists in 21 minutes. Um, the, the, the guy I wanted to highlight was DeLon Wright, who was completely benched against Houston. I mean, I don't know what the hell that was about. Nick Nurse gave some very nonsensical explanations. I think at first that night on Friday when he was asked after the game, it was like, oh, you know, I, it was a matchup thing. I wanted CJ in there for a shooting, which like, bro, what? CJ Miles is now ahead of DeLon Wright? Like, because what? He had three good games? Like, that's that's how you're going to treat DeLon? Like, that's that's not right. Um you know, and CJ had like 0 for 2 shooting that night. And it was like, oh, we want Pat McCaw for his length. Like, what? You want you want length? Why do you have Fred Van Vliet and then Kyle Lowry playing the backcourt together with OG at center? What kind of kind of thinking is that? So it didn't really make sense to me. But um, DeLon came in today. I think he took it in stride. And he really, really delivered. Um, you know, he played with all-out effort, which is great. Especially after he came off the bench in the second quarter. He got to play like almost like 10 minutes straight in the um, – in the second quarter there, he, he had a really extended run that, you know, was with the bench, but then he also played with the starters a while too. And, uh, you know, he hit a three, which was nice, no hesitation, real smooth on the release, which is rare for DeLon. Um, you know, got to the rim for two driving layups, got to the free throw line for four attempts. I mean, had a steal, had a huge block in transition, which was like, wow, I can't believe he did a chase down block. I think that was right after he got a turnover too. So he really, really hustled. And I just liked the way he played and responded to the benching. You know, there's, Players can go one of two ways after getting benched. You know, they either completely fall off and they sort of don't accept it and they, they, you know, they sulk or they, you know, are defiant. And I think DeLon showed some defiance today and I think he deserves more opportunities. I think he does, but, you know, we'll see. We'll see. Um, And then, yeah, the other thing was Monroe. I mean, damn. Like, he only played three minutes, so I'm not going to get too hard on him, but damn. Three minutes minus three. Got one rebound, did nothing else. And this is like five straight games that Monroe has given the Raptors literally nothing. Like, negative value. And whatever, he's a third big, but he doesn't play defense. And for the most part, he doesn't play offense now. And it's like, what are we really doing? You know? What what are we really, really doing? Um, the Raptors' lack of depth in the front court has really been exposed. I mean, like, to start the game, Monroe wasn't even in the game. He he wasn't in the, in the, in the original rotation, I think, that the coaches drew up. I think it was really just because Pascal and, and Serge sort of ended up both in foul trouble that, you know, okay, Monroe had to go out there for three minutes, and he just – he wasn't – he, it wasn't like the lawn, right? He, he went the other way. He just, he just literally did nothing. So that's disappointing. But, uh, um, yeah, the Raptor starters, you know, they pulled it out. In terms of your three stars – 
Man, this is a tough game, really. I guess the first star goes to Kawhi. I mean, he did have 33 points, 10 rebounds, 3 assists, but uh, was a little bit inefficient, 10 and 23. He could do a little bit better, but got to the free throw line 11 times, hit three threes. It really does offset the fact. I mean, look, he had 33 points on 23 shots. That's pretty good. Um, yeah, Kawhi was good. I, the one thing I would like to see more of is Kawhi guarding the other team's best player. Like, Kawhi only got on Doncic a couple times, and even Doncic actually had a couple scores, which was really impressive, but... Um, you know, you would like to see Kawhi on Doncic more often. Really, he only played on Doncic because of either a couple of switches or because Danny Green was in foul trouble, which, like, you know, ideally you would like to put Kawhi on Doncic, right? I mean, Danny's great, but, like, Danny's, like, 6'7", and Doncic is, like, 6'9". Like, you'd rather put Kawhi on there. Kawhi matches him physically better. So, you know, whatever. But I guess Kawhi needs to save his energy for offense right now, and offensively he's delivering, so you can't really complain. Also, the clutch points were, were really nice. Shout out clutch points. Um, second star, I'm going to give it to Kyle Lowry. 19 points, 5 rebounds, 9 assists, a steal, 2 blocks. Uh, 5 of 14 shooting overall, but those 5 were all 3s. And then, you know, like I mentioned, the, the fact that he's there's actually a play for Kyle to actually score now is really, really reassuring. I mean, he just – it's just been depressing watching him struggle. And then third star, ah, man, I, I don't even know. Like, I, 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 I guess I'll give it to DeLon – for responding well, but I mean, like, Pascal really struggled in this game, Serge really struggled in this game, Danny was guarding Doncic, and he had 35, so, I don't know, I, I guess I'll give it to DeLon, but, uh, I don't, I don't feel great about that one, but, uh, in terms of your Gerald Henderson award, Doncic, I mean, he really deserves it, but I, I, you know, like, it's almost insulting, I, I feel like 35, 12 rebounds, 10 assists on 14 to 24 shooting is, Kind of within his wheelhouse nowadays. So I'm actually going to give it to Dorian Finney-Smith, who I've always thought is terrible. Like, he just doesn't look like he would be any good. He doesn't look skilled. Um, but he had 13 points, 5 rebounds off the bench, 6-9 and nine shooting with a 3, uh, and also had 3 steals and a block. Very energetic. I mean, the one thing he does do is he's energetic defensively, but his offensive skill set has always sort of just been really, really depressing to watch. Um, but today he was really active off the bench. So, you know, I'll give it to him. So that does for the podcast. Uh, you can read 10 things on Twitter and, uh, you know, thanks as always for supporting and uh, sharing my work and stuff. Um, and yeah, I'll be back on Thursday to recap the Bucks game. That's gonna be a big one. That's going to be a really big one.